heritage properties in the town of East Fremantle. We work very closely with town staff and we deliver that to the town uh, with no cash contribution uh, other than a peppercorn lease in that property that was otherwise vacant. Uh, we've just established uh, another partnership with the City of Bunbury, doing the same thing in an office down on Victoria Street in the heart of Bunbury with local community members and volunteers. Uh, those programs that re we operate generate a sufficient revenue so that we can employ staff members uh, who are trained historians and archivists and artists uh, to oversee the projects and to create all of the content that we deliver. Uh, in our Perth office, we took over what was a pretty boring looking office space, an 80s, uh, 80s fit out, blue paint everywhere and glass partitions. We renovated that uh, property into our gallery space today, which is a, a really beautiful uh, space in an Art Deco building. Uh, we've done a range of other interesting projects and uh, we're looking at opportunities throughout Perth, but in particular in the eastern suburbs, because while we've got something in the southwest and something in the south and something in Perth Central, we haven't got a presence in the eastern suburbs. I'm the descendant of two pensioner guards on both sides of my family, uh, and so I've been interested for a long while in the pensioner guard cottage in Bassendine and I've been following Council's various plans and proposals for the site. And I can understand how we have gotten to this point. The town obviously uh, had a commitment, and it's been an abiding commitment, to protect the site through its acquisition, through the various plans and interpretation plans that have been developed uh, for the proposals over, over time, and of course the Child Health Centre being the most recent one. And I applaud the town for putting in all of that money uh, to devise plans, uh, though sadly they haven't come to fruition because we know things can be expensive and projects can get complicated. So I understand that the town is now potentially looking to find not-for-profit or community partners to deliver a great outcome for the community and to take on what is a bit of a scary and complex project. I don't know if you've all been through the building, uh, <laughs> but it does need a lot of work. And uh, I was having a chat to a council staff member today and broke out in sweats when he uh, gave me a rundown of all of the work that does need to occur. Uh, but it is a very important site and it's important that the community uh, is able to access it and uh, it's important that the site is preserved. Our proposal would be, uh, although it's still in draft of course, but to partner with the Bassendine Historical Society and other community groups who wish to use the site to uh, take over the site for the purpose of initiating a local history and research training facility uh, so that we can train local people in historical research skills, in genealogical skills, in writing skills, to actually work in partnership with your local studies librarian and other community members to greater celebrate the history of the town of Bassendine and the surrounds. Uh, that those programs would generate revenue such that we would be able to then invest in further restoration of the building. But we would, we would propose that that be done in stages because when you've got a $1.2 million cost sitting in front of you, it would scare anyone off. But when you can work you know, at a smaller pace and do things in stages so that we first look at you know, restoring the ceiling and restoring the floorboards and the, the skirting boards and repairing cracks and making the building safe. And then as funds are raised, we're able to you know, work on the exterior appearance of the building and look at replacing the roof tiles with tin as it should have been and you know, working in a staged fashion over a medium period of time, four, five, six years, that I think we're gonna be able to achieve a really good outcome for the site without having to pitch in a whole lot of money all at once. Um, so, you know, we've spoken with the Historical Society and met with them on site. Uh, I've spoken to other community members. I don't have all of the answers and I don't have a million dollars in the bank to solve the problem, but I do think uh, that if the council decides to open uh, this up to a public tender process, then we may be interested in making a submission. We would do that in partnership with local community groups and would want to work in lockstep with the historical society who have been custodians of the site and the cottage for many years. Uh, of course the intention is to open the cottage up to the public for public use to be able to celebrate the history of that site. We would like to see the front 
half of the residence used for uh, gallery and exhibition space, as has been you know, planned through various iterations of the proposals, uh, and then to use the rear of the residence for office use, where we would conduct our training programs, and that would help us to generate the revenue to make the entire thing operate. Now, of course, if the town wishes to hold on to the property and do all of that yourselves, then that would also be a great outcome for the community. Uh, but that's a decision for council. Uh, if you're interested in looking at a community partnership model, then we'd be open to potentially making a submission. But we'd need to continue conversations with local community groups uh, and get some more information from your own team about the costs involved in the restoration so that we can put in place a business case um, that would tick all of the boxes and achieve those outcomes for the community. Thanks, Reese. It's really exciting to hear about the work you've been doing elsewhere with other local governments and hear your passion for promoting history and incorporating the local community into that. Um, I've had the benefit of having a couple of conversations with you that other councillors haven't yet. Um, you mentioned a couple of times just then about the programs generating revenue. Yes. Um, would you be able to just explain oh, yes. to everybody else how that works? Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, the federal government, through various uh, training programs, of course, in a COVID environment and given high rates of unemployment across the nation, the federal government is very much committed to seeing people back into work. Uh, one of the ways that uh, the federal government has invested money is in workplace training programs, where people can be hosted in not-for-profit organisations to learn workplace skills and uh, to carry out uh, work on behalf of those organisations uh, which are of community benefit. The host organisation, which is us, the Perth History Association, receives a fee from the federal government to create a training place. Uh, we're also eligible for wage subsidies uh, if we're employing uh, local people to work on the project. Uh, there are a range of wage subsidies which are available through federal programs at the moment. Uh, our annual turnover uh, in the last, uh, or just before COVID hit, because we've all been a bit buffeted by that, but our annual turnover was about $500,000 in the 12 months before uh, COVID hit. We've got nine staff, three offices, and about 100 people who are carrying out our training programs across our three offices. So we're, we're at a scale. Uh, we're able to generate enough revenue to be able to be self-funding. Our Museum of Perth isn't funded by the city. We're not the state museum either. We're an independent private not-for-profit organisation. Uh, and really what, what I have been trying to do is to develop a business model where we're able to create positive community impact and celebrate the history of the communities of Western Australia without having to go cap in hand to government all the time for funding because that is a diminishing pool of money. And, uh, and you know, lots of people have tried for a, a very long time, uh, and there are some really good examples where it's worked, uh, but you know, all of us are aware that funds are tight at the moment, uh, and constantly asking for government grants puts organisations in a position where they're not really in charge of their own destiny, and they're always trying to you know, do an acquittal and do a, an application process. So, Unlike uh, that example, we're trying to create a business model where we're able to be self-funding and generate that positive community impact uh, off our own back. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions for councillors? Yes, Councillor Gandrew. Uh, thank you very much. Just so I get an understanding, um, so you, your, your proposal would be, given the considerable cost, I imagine, yeah. involved with, with restora restoration, to be gifted the site, your organisation, that's the what you would like to see, the outcome you'd like to see? Sure, well, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure uh, what Council's proposal is at this point, uh, but the, 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 the model that you could compare this to is, for example, the City of Vincent and their Anzac Cottage in Mount Hawthorne. Uh, they, uh, that was a City of Vincent asset for many years. They've decided to divest that site to the National Trust, uh, and that was as a gift with the idea that the community benefit was was the return. So yes, we don't have you know a couple of hundred yeah. thousand dollars to pitch in to buy yeah. the site. And anyway, I'm not really sure what its commercial value would, would be, be given yeah. all of mm. the works involved and the heritage uh, requirements yeah. in place. Yeah, because that, that, that then leads on to 
my next question is the cost outlay, obviously, that would then be involved with the restoration. So mm. would you be looking at the town to contribute uh, any funding towards the restoration of the site? Sure. Well, uh, I'm not sure at the moment because we haven't uh, had access to the structural engineer's report or other kind of costings. I've had yep. mm -hmm. some verbal discussions with officers that have given me a picture of what some of the costs would be. Um, to be really blunt, I think builders and contractors might pitch a bit higher at a council tender process than in a private scenario. So you might find that a not-for-profit organisation or just any private client would probably get a better deal out of a local builder than a council would, in my experience. Uh, so I would really like to see uh, what you know some other quotes might be at some of the restoration work. Uh, if that didn't have to go through a council tender process, we might find that we get kind of a, a better bang for buck. Yeah, and just my final question is just again, in relation to, to costs and stuff, what, what would you see, just, I, I understand you haven't really done the, the finite uh, looking into the nitty gritty, mm. but you, you, you're talking about uh, over a potential six year period. Yes. What, what would you, you see being able to be achieved, for example, if you were to acquire the site sure. with, with, within the first year? So my immediate priority would be making the, so um, just so that everyone understands, and I'm sure you do, the cottage sits separately mm -hmm. from the residence yep. on the same lot. Uh, the cottage is in good structural condition. Mm -hmm. There are some aesthetic, uh, there's some aesthetic work that needs to be done, as well as some roof repairs and other relatively minor, but not urgent work to be done there. The residence, on the other hand, it has been deemed unsafe for uh, occupation because of risk of uh, potential ceiling collapse and cracking in walls and other issues. So, uh, my immediate priority in the first 12 months would be. Uh, to see ceiling repairs and crack repairs and sign off that the building was safe to occupy. That would allow us to open up training programs which would allow us to generate the revenue. Um, and you know, and so yeah, the immediate priority would be that fifty to a hundred thousand dollars worth of work to check that the electricity, uh, that all of the wiring and plumbing was in good working condition, that the ceilings wouldn't collapse and that the building was structurally sound. Uh, and you would then have to continue to invest money over time uh, to get the community outcome, which would be you know, the, the brickwork on the outside, the reshaping of the roof, the replacement of concrete tiles with tin and, uh, and the rest. But we wouldn't look to be proposing a modern build out the back, uh, aka the Child Health Centre model. Um, there's also the 2011 uh, proposal, which had a small studio in the back left-hand corner um, we're not seeing that we would need to do that uh, in order to operate there effectively. So it would really just be about restoring and making good the current build that's on site, making sure that that was safe, and then investing money over time uh, to restore the property. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Um, so with this stage process, do you perhaps perceive a time where once you've achieved the restoration of the front building that you might look at what you might do towards the back because clearly there have been other iterations that have speculated about what can be done out the back so I'm assuming that if all goes well and you um, have a program of works over say five years mm. um, that if you're still generating income and if it's, it's working really well for you that you would possibly look at um, how you might use the back of the property, is that right? Well, I mean, I think that for for the purposes that we're looking at it for, and I think it would be in the best interest of the community to have the rear garden landscaped and usable for visiting community groups, maybe having a barbecue out the back and uh, maybe growing some veggies, although there's not a lot of sun out the back. But really, I see the back of the property as for a garden purpose. Excellent. Uh, and I don't really envisage uh, the need because functionally I don't think we would just need the space to build anything out the back. Uh, I really think that there's sufficient space within the residence to be able to do what we want, which is to create a visitor and gallery experience and run training programs. And I don't envisage the need for there to be extra space. There have been plans where the back veranda is bricked in to create a, perhaps a larger space out the back, you know, relatively small amendments to the footprint. Uh, in the back half of the residence, yeah, which is more 1950s, mm. uh, less 1893. 
So, but yeah, we don't have any designs to construct anything on the back or do anything double story or um, to do anything of the kind. It would just be about the restoration of the existing footprint. Mind you, restoration of the, the uh, surround the veranda. The veranda. Yes. Would actually give you a lot of the outdoor working space, space anyway. So, Correct. and that's in our climate. Yes, yeah, uh, you know, the ability for people to sit out on a bench and enjoy the garden uh, under the veranda and the eaves. So, yeah, certainly the plans have been about reinstating the original veranda and shape of the residence, which okay. would be a priority. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So just on the programs, Therese, um, the sorts of skills that people are, are picking up from the programs, I understand are things like research skills um, yes. and general sort of uh, working with IT sort of stuff, I suppose. Yes. Um, but that's the research is looking into biographies of people who've already passed away, so you re reconnect with the that's history right. of the place. And you also have a, a focus on Aboriginal um, art and presentations and places, etc. Yeah, that's Which is correct. something that we're very keen on here. Yes, our, our current exhibition in the gallery is called Nyala Budja Mili Mili, and it's about Aboriginal place names of the central city. We worked in partnership with the State Records Office uh, and uh, Aboriginal History Unit of WA to deliver that. It's looking at 31 place names in the central city, but they have about 350 unique place names identified, and I'm sure many of them would be out this way of the woods as well. Um, it is a real passion for us, and uh, yeah, we're very proud of that work. But in relation to the training programs, we're looking to upskill people in the areas of research. Uh, online online work because uh, that's really the future for a lot of people. Uh, so looking at, at administrative skills, bookkeeping, uh, volunteer management, research writing, biographical writing, website design and graphic design, those are all of the skills that we impart on our training participants at the moment. And that's why we're also able to do things very cost effectively because we have in-house skill sets to be able to design exhibitions and deliver exhibitions much more cheaply than if we went out to a private provider. Thank you. Um, looking at your website today and looking at some of the programs that you have delivered, I was interested to see um, the diversity. It's really quite intriguing yes, that yeah. where, where you've gone with some of your programs. And I looked at the one, the uh, flat above London Court. Yes, yes. And I thought that was really interesting how you did that to restore it to its um, 1937, Seven, I yep, think it was. Correct. Um, and the use of um, some volunteers with skills mm. to actually help you restore that. That was really interesting how you kept your costs down on that. Yeah, so our mission and purpose is to engage the community in the celebration of history. Uh, and to provide training and opportunities uh, for people in that process. London Court, as an example, everyone would have a story about London Court. When it was designed in 1937, there were 24 <coughs> residential one-bedroom flats incorporated into the design. Many of them are empty. The owners have agreed to give us a peppercorn lease on one of the flats for the purpose of restoring it to its 1937 appearance and to create a small visitor experience and a museum upstairs. Uh, we're able to do that with volunteers. We've had about 28 volunteers come forward, including a painter, two electricians, an interior designer, journalists, researchers and the like. And that's, uh, while there's a lot of work that needs to be done by qualified tradespeople at Surrey Street, uh, there is still a lot of work that can be done by volunteers, cleaning and gardening and painting and other things. So we'd be looking to keep the costs down uh, by using volunteer labour where that was appropriate. I thought it was a fascinating program, thank you. Let's give Councillor Quinter the opportunity to ask her a question and then we might move on. Thank you. Uh, so, the, so the decision we're making next week is not to hand this to you. That's right. Uh, it's to go out to for an expression of interest. So I'm just trying to get a sense from you what the market is like in terms of your speciality and mm. your business and are there other people um, or organisations or companies that do similar things? to you, is, is it quite a specialised business sure. that you run? Uh, yes, that's right. I was asked to present tonight because of, we've got a model of operation that is akin to what Council's considering. Uh, there's not, that there are not a lot of organisations like ours, I have to say. We're relatively unique in this space in that where our funding model is self-funding. you know, self -funding. 
uh, but also, I mean, the, the other main party, the other main player in this space would be the National Trust. And my understanding of uh, the position of the Trust is that over many years they've been gifted a whole bunch of properties that government departments didn't want on their books because they were just sitting there as liabilities, maintenance liabilities. So the trust has been loaded up over many years with lots of properties and lots of a maintenance backlog. Uh, and they've had some difficulty in making progress with some of their properties and don't want to take on more than they can handle. Uh, so, so there are not many organisations that do the kind of work that we do. Although it may be the case that other not-for-profit organisations come forward with a different and alternative vision for the site. Absolutely. This section of the Act uh, is, my understanding of it is that it allows local government to divest property to not-for-profit organisations. Uh, if it's for, to companies or to private organisations or people, it has to go through a standard sale pro process. Um, but when it's a not-for-profit organisation and it, there's a demonstrated community benefit, uh, then local government's able to deal with it in that way. Mm. And, and you have access, uh, and you probably have before, uh, applied for grant funding. Um, uh, is that something that you're quite uh, versed in now? And yep. where to get grants from uh, and how to apply for them? What kinds of grants are available? Certainly. Well, given that Lottery West had already made a contribution or an offer of a contribution to a project on this site, they're going to be the obvious ones to hit up. Uh, and so, you know, um, and so we will go to them with a pared back um, version of what Council had proposed that proposes the restoration and activation of the residence as it stands without the new build to the back. And hopefully they uh, are happy to still make a contribution of kinds, particularly because the work would go towards construction and that's going to create local jobs. Uh, and I know that they've got a COVID-19 focus at the moment. So Lottery West are the obvious ones. State Heritage Council would be the, uh, the other one. They do have grants from time to time, or, or should I say annually. Uh, and we've not received a State Heritage Council grant before because we don't own a State Heritage listed property uh, and so we would be eligible to apply for that. So this would be your first property that you would own? Yes, correct. Yep. Yep. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you so much for your time tonight and as acknowledged, um, the decision we made next week about what option Council will support and if the option is in alignment with the officer's recommendation, we hope that you submit I might. <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, send me the um, structural engineer's report and I fall over and faint, you might not see me again. So <laughs> well, let's sure. hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> but I no, really appreciate you being here tonight Thanks and sharing you. all of your experience. Um, it's, really, it's really great to hear. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, okay, so we'll move on to the next deputation now. So we've got Ben Carter, who is here from um, Pinnacle Planning representing the Cork and Bottle. So, Ben is speaking to item 7.2, which is the proposal for extensions for patio, patio and cafe blinds at the front of the Cork Road. So welcome, Ben. Thank you, uh, Mayor, for your opportunity to present. And thanks to the CEO as well for giving us a late item on the, on the agenda. We do appreciate that. Unfortunately, not as exciting as the last matter, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> we're all here to, to talk about it. So I'll keep it uh, very brief. Uh, obviously, the application is really just to make more comfortable an existing space. Uh, as an alfresco that's there already. Uh, the business cork and bottle, uh, as we know, has an alfresco at the front, which is uh, quite successful. Uh, the purpose or drive behind this application is to give more year-round functionality for that space uh, to assist with, I guess, giving more uh, longevity and success to that business and really, I guess, helping to contribute to activating the street in, in a business where uh, you've got people that are you know, spending you know, large portions of the year uh, in a space that they can't currently do because it doesn't have any roof or shelter facilities. Uh, effectively, it doesn't make the space any larger than what it is at the moment, so it's the same floor um, footprint and floor space. Uh, it effectively just looks to put some shelter in place. Uh, there is some reference there to some of the trees that are in and around uh, the actual alfresco space. The two uh, very large shade trees on either side, when the alfresco was initially put in place, uh, is deliberately uh, designed to steer clear of those two. Uh, there is a very small uh, tree which the staff have reviewed and confirmed has no ecological and very low amenity value and they've actually assigned, uh, I think they've assigned a, 
of value at one of the uh, at one of the condition or suggested condition light items as, as several thousand dollars in terms of the cost contribution towards other trees in a more suitable location, uh, which our client is happy to uh, make that contribution in, in line with some of the other comments I've heard around trees this evening. Uh, so realistically, here to uh, thank again the, the CEO for her support in getting this up as a late item and also to uh, answer any questions if there were any. Thank you. A number of us met on site a little bit earlier this evening with the staff members who have been involved in the application and there were a couple of questions that were raised around the tree but also around um, the proposal for the, the cafe blinds and fully enclosing the space. So there were some concerns about the visual impact and it blocking um, visual access to some of the other businesses and how that might uh, be problematic. Um, I noticed in the report that the staff had originally um, suggested that it be redesigned particularly around the tree and um, so that it fitted in better with the streetscape. I'm just wondering whether any modifications were made after getting that advice from the town staff? Yes, so we met with uh, Donna uh, Shaw, the, the, city, the town's current manager. There were some previous, uh, how do I put this diplomatically, very stringent requirements in terms of what the space should be or could be or, or ought to be. Uh, when we re-engaged with Donna in the last couple of weeks, uh, the commentary was it effectively isn't going to materially change the visual appearance of it in terms of what it is at the moment. It has a flat roof on it, it effectively is what it is with a flat roof. So the notion to, I guess, go about redesigning the space, more recent discussions I've had with Donna is that realistically the town's in a full review of a lot of its documentation at the moment. So in terms of what the streetscape would, would be and, and the future character is desired to be, that's potentially you know, up for future discussions, as, as, as Don had put it, so it was realistically, um, there wasn't a substantial visual difference adding a roof onto the existing structure, so it was more around the need to actually go and reinvent the wheel, and, and it was put to us that it wasn't. So that was, that was essentially um, where it was left. Okay, would you like to ask your question, Councillor Hamilton? Um, Yes, I, I did express concerns about the visual um, ability to see the adjoining retailers, sure. um, particularly the pet food shop, um, because their entry is right adjoining the wall of Cork and Bobble. And I note that the bottom half of the structure you're planning to put in wooden panels at one just over a metre high on three sides. and. Um, the rest is blinds coming down. So my question is in respect to um, those panels which create a barrier, yep. visual barrier to, and also it creates a walking barrier because Cork and Bottle is not open during the daytime on the weekdays. So people can walk through that pagoda to the pet food shop and the, the uh, sure. fish and chip shop. So um, by creating this barrier, do you perceive that there might be a negative impact on the adjoining businesses from foot traffic? Look, it's a reasonable question. It's certainly one that I guess hadn't come, hadn't come up to us or had, hadn't been apparent to us. What I could suggest, um, just off the top of my head, and certainly happy to take it back to our clients, potentially does it really need barriers all the way around at the bottom? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. There could be a, a reason as to why that is. But if you equate this more to a, in your own home, a lot of us have those blinds that go up and down now, they're, they're quite good, uh, but they go all the way to the ground and they're actually quite structural these days. So you could potentially just have blinds on the sides and actually um, can retract right up when they're not in use. So that's something I can certainly take back to them and, and, and have as a discussion. I would imagine the difference between just having a roof and some sort of ability to, uh, I guess, have some shelter would be better than not at all and, and the thing doesn't get through because we're, they're sticking to that hard. Could I suggest closure. to you potentially, um, I'll ask the question here, would, would it be open to you to look at the, because generally with wind direction and rain, it comes from one direction yeah. in that street because yeah. you've got the building behind and it, you know, nothing comes in that direction. So potentially um, would the client be open to looking at um, only putting in blinds on say one and a half sides, which would leave it more open 
um, because if you're only getting rain, because you're wanting to enclose it for weather conditions, that's what I'm understanding. Sure. So if that's the, the reality of why you want to enclose it, then if you're only getting bad weather from one side, theoretically you don't need to enclose the whole thing, would that be right? It's not the bad weather you use those fabric blinds for. Good question, but it's not actually the, the bad weather you use it for. It's when it's absolutely middle of summer, those blinds have a great UV and solar function as well. So they actually allow you to sit in an outdoor space that um, isn't in direct sunlight effectively. So yes, they help with uh, rain and, and squally winds and all those sorts of things when it's raining, but effectively, um, the purpose of those sort of blind mechanisms is also when it's when it's hot as well. Let's let someone else ask. Councillor Quinn, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. All right then. Um, uh, we went down to the site today. There are three pillars that face Old Perth Road, yep. um, and I'm not sure if this discussion had been had. But were they amenable to just enclosing to the third pillar and then leaving the third to the fourth pillar? Uh, open the roof at least so that the tree can remain and then do blinds on the outside which would provide that heat in the summer although I'm not convinced by that because there's trees there anyway um, would they be amenable to just covering to the third pillar so in terms of covering it up to a point to allow that tree underneath to stay there effectively yep. uh, I'd have to take the question on notice I mean that, that's not what the proposal is but uh, we're happy to, happy to have that discussion. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, Councillor Hamilton. Follow up question. You talked about the, the blinds um, reducing heat, but given the trading hours of the Port and Bottle, which are primarily evenings, late afternoons through to evenings, I'm not entirely sure why you would need that heat resistant. My thoughts on this, and, and you must correct me if I'm wrong, my thoughts were that you would only use these blinds pretty much in winter. I actually had no concept that you might use them in summertime to, because there's trees all around there. I just, I, I'm a bit confused about, given the trading hours of the pop and bottle, why you would need to use them in summertime. Well, I hope I haven't opened up Pandora's box by... <laughs> by answering in that way, but they do. Um, I guess that it's been put to me that it's an all year, the purpose of, is to allow, allow that space to be used all of the year, not just middle of winter, middle of, middle of summer restrictions as well. You do get, um, in the middle of summer, heat and sun into, into the afternoons and evenings at certain points as well, so uh, it's definitely for that. But look, I can certainly take uh, some of the points that we've had here on, on, on notice and see if we can come back with some changes if, if, if there's a desire to do that. Thank you. There was another question from Councillor yes. Ganjo. Thank you. Uh, I just I love investment into the town. Uh, now, can I ask, are you happy with the current officer recommendation as it is stated? Yes. Thank you. That's all I need to know. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, if you are able to have that conversation with the applicants on those specific items so that there can be a conversation with the staff so that next week when it comes to a decision on site and there's some clarity around what would or wouldn't be possible and acceptable, that would be really helpful for councillors sure. for next week. Right. Thank you for being here. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Sorry, I didn't feel too interrogated. No, that's not a problem. <laughs> had a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank enjoy you. your evening. No, absolutely not. <laughs> All right, everybody, um, that's it for the deputation. So we'll move on to the officer reports. Um, the first one on the agenda is uh, 7.1, which is in relation to one Surrey Street that we just had the deputation on from Rhys Harley. Um, I should just also declare an impartiality interest. I have a family member who's on the board of the organisation that Rhys represents, but will not, be able, will not impact my decision making. Mr Gibson, would you like to speak to this report? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this item, uh, there's obviously a lot of history to it, um, and many people in the room would uh, know a great deal about it, uh, but this particular item before uh, Council this Tuesday next uh, is to consider the various options relating to the site that it owns in Fee Simple. Uh, in July this year, Council considered a tender associated with the comprehensive redevelopment of the site and resolved to effectively discontinue that project. Um, that discontinuance notwithstanding, obviously the town still owns the site and therefore needs to determine from a land asset perspective 
uh, what it is to do with the site uh, and what is to happen with it. Um, clearly the officer report sets out a number of options and recommends to council that it seeks to dispose of it via a public tender process uh, and one that considers various elements of community benefit. Um, on the basis of that staff recommendation, which is to effectively dispose of the site, uh, it subsequently also recommends uh, the council relinquish the remaining lottery rest grant of $37,500, uh, which relates specifically to the cottage. Uh, it is open to council, of course, to pursue any of the other options listed in the officer report. Um, but in doing so, if any of those options uh, involve retention of the site, uh, further consideration would need to be given to uh, ongoing maintenance and use of the site. Um, I expect there'll be a, a few questions and they'll be shared by myself, Paul and Phil. Great, just before questions, I just wanted to make sure councillors were all aware there was an email sent early this afternoon, um, just bringing our attention to an update on the report. So that was on page five, um, the third and fourth paragraph have been, some changes have been made there. What changes? Maybe I don't have the copyright in front of me. Would you mind reading out the changes for us? On page 5 of 64, the project did not proceed at that time and the funds remain in the land and building infrastructure reserve. So this refers to, there was some commentary on Facebook in terms of the sale of the Masonic Lodge and $150,000 uh, was to be attributed to the refurbishment of Surrey Street. So um, we have spent more than $150,000 since the sale of the Masonic Lodge in 2011. Um, the second paragraph referred to by the Mayor, yeah. the town has spent more than $150,000 on the refurbishment of Surrey Street over the last five years. It is open to council, it is open with council Everyone. approval to draw down on the reserve to reimburse that expenditure up to $150,000 in the March 2021 budget review after Council has made a decision on Surrey Street, extinguishing the funds set aside from the sale of the Masonic Lodge. So this is more a, a, a paragraph that addresses the accounting treatment of the funds. So the funds weren't necessarily drawn from the land and building reserve for Surrey Street. They were drawn from other account codes. So basically what's suggested is that money be put back in the land and building reserve fund. So, Thomas, so just to clarify, um, <coughs> in terms of the significant amount of that money has been spent on preparing plans and so on for the site, so if council was to support the officer recommendation and another organisation not for profit, for profit was to take it over, those reports would be able to be made available to them for the purposes of restoring whatever they had intended for the site? Um, I think we'd have to look at the intellectual property rights of those plans um, to do so, but in going to the market um, with a public tender, we would provide as much information as possible to enable an individual or an organisation to do the required due diligence so that they were aware of exactly what they were getting. Thank Councillor Ganjo, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Your Worship. Just uh, in relation um, to the statement that was just made, so just so I can understand, so in refurbishment as such, so I don't think there's been any refurbishment undertaken other than perhaps maintenance. I'm not sure if refurbishment's the right word to use in this context. I think maybe maintenance. Um, so it, it, my understanding is 84,000 perhaps has been spent on maintenance, then the further allocation of funds have been spent on the plans. I'm just trying to understand what, what, the, what, what the differential of the, of the outgoings have been. Um, we can certainly provide a breakdown of all that expenditure in yep. terms of budget line items. Yeah, so if, if you could, because I think it's more maintenance than, than refurbishment and, and the, obviously the, the, the plans as well that have been done. Thank you. Councillor Quinton. Just going back to the Mayor's point about the reports and intellectual property, would it be possible then to, by next week, get a list of those reports? Because I would assume that um, the intellectual property reports would apply to the architectural drawings and not necessarily to any of the building assessment works uh, that might be able to be handed over. So is it possible to have a, the, the list of reports and have that categorised by whether we can hand it over or not? Certainly. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Um, in respect to those reports, 
my memory is that we did have a breakdown provided to us just after I was elected to council. Uh, so I think we can actually go back. Um, it was in one of the confidential documents. It was pretty much in the month or two just after I was elected to council. So there is a breakdown available to us um, fairly quickly and it was a substantial expenditure over a multifaceted um, range of um, items. So that was nearly three years ago, is that what Yeah, it was, I think, November or December 2017. I'll have a look myself, because I've certainly got a hard copy. Other questions, councillors? No? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I can respond to Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you for your Mayor. Okay, so again, you can probably provide some information now yep. in relation to the differences in those costs. So the 84,000 that was in the original draft, the uh, original report that went out as far as the, uh, with the briefing papers, was only for the last two years. So um, maintenance type expenditure has been excluded from these figures. Um, so in the initial report, um, prior to the amendments um, just read out by the CEO, there was a figure stated of eighty-four thousand dollars for um, is things related, things that aren't maintenance related. So in relation to broadly the Surrey Street project, um, and that consists of um, so the figure for eighty-four thousand was for the last two financial years, um, and due to a change, due to the wording of the paper going back to the last um, decision in two thousand eleven. It was um, deemed appropriate to look at the more fulsome costs, and therefore the costs um, over the last five years on this project total at the moment are in excess of $150,000. Um, and they're broken down into um, architectural costs, yeah. mm. design and preparation, um, project management, and a small um, cost for uh, tendering and contracting. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my point was that um, refurbishment is not the word the appropriate word to be using um, in relation to the, the report, because refurbishment would say I guess that what, some um, works have actually Mr. been White was saying, uh, under, in order undertaken. to do the refurbishment and restoration, you need to do the plans in advance. Yeah, but they're very yeah. different to actually refurbishment. Refurbishment it refers okay. to actions being undertaken. All right. Councillor Quinton, did you have a question? Yes, I just wanted to go back to uh, Luke Gibson's uh, answer to Nani Jacobson's question about a deed of agreement. Can you explain to me what, how that would play out? Who gets involved in that conversation? What kind of controls we get to have through a deed of agreement? Uh, through Madam Mayor, basically a deed of agreement is a, uh, a legal agreement between two parties um, that sets that set out the terms uh, relating to a particular thing, in this case a land transaction, and it would endure beyond the time of the transaction, obviously the point was made uh, by the member of the public that once the transaction occurs, the town no longer owns the land, so the only way to ensure some level of control is to have, have, to, to have an enduring legal agreement. The things that would go into that would depend on the nature of the submission and the commitments made as part of the application. If someone came to the town and said, um, we would like to take this off the town and we commit to um, doing X, Y and Z to the cottage and X, Y and Z to the residence, um, those commitments could be embedded into that deed of agreement setting time frames as to when those things should occur and obliging them to do it and having that supported by a caveat, which means they couldn't on-sell the land to a third party without uh, the third party also entering into those same commitments. And just going to any specifics, if they don't um, fulfil any of the obligations of the deed of agreement, what would happen then? Well, the deed of agreement would need to set out what the repercussions are and what the subsequent steps are. Okay, thank so you. So there's no fixed answer, uh, but what council may be prepared to accept uh, is, I suppose, dependent on what proposals are submitted to council. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, thank you. We'll move on then. So item 7.2 is in relation to the additions to the corporate model that we also had the deputation on. Um, a number of councillors were able to meet on site and already had the opportunity to ask staff questions, but if there are other questions after, do you like to speak to this? Yeah. 
After Mr. Gibson has spoken, that would be welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this item uh, seeks Council's decision on an application for development approval on land in front of the Cork and Bottle site on Oldfield Road. Um, the location already accommodates an existing structure, and this application seeks to add a roof uh, and a side panels and cafe blinds as well. Uh, these works do require the approval of, do require the removal of a street tree, and the applicant uh, has is prepared to pay the amenity value of that tree, uh, which is captured in the officer report. Um, in considering the matter, uh, it's noted that the tree is in relatively poor condition, uh, which a, an arborist has attributed to poor quality nursery stock, uh, resulting in uh, girdling roots and poor root development. Um, and that is uh, seemingly a fairly common thing for that species of tree along Old Perth Road. Uh, it is recommended the Council approve the application subject to the conditions, uh, so as to add vibrancy and activity to the town centre uh, and support local businesses. Uh, it is open, however, for Council to impose additional conditions uh, relating to any design changes that it sees fit. Uh, and to that end, the applicant has obviously um, given an undertaking to go back to the client to see what changes they would be willing to make. Um, I will note uh, previous discussions with uh, one of the applicants uh, gave the indication that they were open-minded about having uh, full-length cafe blinds uh, rather than having uh, fixed sides. Uh, so that might be something uh, Mr Carter returns to town staff with. That would be great. And if we could have um, a response from them support before the council meeting, that would be greatly appreciated. Councillor Hamilton. Um, through the Chair, I'm just interested in page 12 of the agenda um, states that the proposal provides a sheltered place for pedestrians. Um, should that not read patrons of the business? Because if it's enclosed, it really is not for pedestrians. It will be for patrons of the business, would it not? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. The use of the site uh, would be controlled through a permit under the local law. Uh, it's obviously a separate process to this application for development approval. Uh, and as you uh, previously identified, Councillor Hamilton, is that uh, the business may not seek to use the site uh, at all times um, and when it's not being used under the guise of a permit, assuming Council did approve it, um, it would be open to anyone to access the space. So just continue on, the structure is entirely on the road reserve, the existing pagoda. So we're looking at enclosing a structure that is on town owned road reserve rather than owned by the applicant, correct? Uh, it is road reserve, it's managed by the town, the town doesn't own it in fee yep. as a landowner, but uh, it certainly it is not private land, it's, it's the public room. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wilson? Thank you, Worship. Um, the existing structure, are there any um, bonds or requirements on the owner to remove the structure if they can change their type of business? Uh, not sure. We'd certainly uh, check a file and let you know. Councillor Quinton? So just going back to uh, Councillor Hamilton's point about the pedestrians, how would a pedestrian know that they're allowed to use the space? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, it would be, so the permit would be able to make sure it's open at all times, uh, whether a pedestrian chooses to walk through there or not. Um, that would be up to individual pedestrians. Um, it's certainly if the applicant was open to replacing the fixed sides with full length cafe blinds, uh, it would make movement through the area easier. Uh, and if the, uh, the applicant was prepared to make that change, I think that would be quite well supported. Um, otherwise, it'd be open to council to require the applicant to provide some level of signage uh, to ensure pedestrians are aware that it's a public space. I love that you get to the point eventually. <laughs> uh, so my other question then is: uh, uh, the the applicants or the owners of the cork and bottle have they ever been in a position where they have moved anyone on from the current seating environment that's there? Okay. But they're aware that they are not allowed to do that because it's a road reserve. That conversation has been had that it's a condition because it's a road reserve. Well, 
the use of the area is governed by the permit. Mm -hmm. So if some, so the permit basically allows them to use the area. Uh, if someone is there outside the permit hours, it is a public space. Yeah. Uh, but during uh, what is provided for by the permit, uh, it's able to be used in conjunction with the actual abutting business. Mm. Yep, thank you. Councillor Hamilton? Um, can I ask if the adjoining businesses got a copy of this most recent um, planning application? Should we just wait till people leave the yeah. room so we can all hear? Sorry, what was your question? Okay. So my question is, um, could the administration tell me if the adjoining businesses, uh, particularly the one right next door, has received a copy of this latest iteration of the application with the enclosed um, pagoda or uh, pagola? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, but we can, uh, we can find out. Okay. Councillor Quinton? Have the applicants applied for a parklet? Ever? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I'm not sure what they've applied for. I'm not the mayor, but thank you. <laughs> oh, through so the mayor. Through, through. <laughs> Sorry, I knew that bit. <laughs> Uh, so okay, so there, so if we're talking about activating the space, would it not make sense that they should apply for a parklet? Uh, for you, Madam Mayor, this is an application lodged. Council has an obligation to determine this application rather than encourage them to make other applications. Whether they've made other applications, I'm not sure. Can we find out, please? We can. Thank you. Okay, is that it for questions? Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Um, item 7.3 is the draft amended local planning policy number 7, that's for commercial and mixed use development. This has been out for consultation and is coming for final adoption next week at Council. Would you like to speak to this one, Mr Gibson? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this item seeks Council's final adoption on an amendment to an existing policy, uh, with that existing policy being almost 12 years old. Uh, the matter was previously considered by Council in September, uh, just gone, uh, where it resolved to advertise the draft policy. Uh, that took place and no submissions were received. Uh, that notwithstanding, the staff proposed a further amendment to the policy to exempt solar panels from the need to obtain development approval, and it's recommended that Council adopt the policy. Thank you. Any questions on this one? Okay, great. So we'll move on then. Um, item 7.4. Four, which is the proposed tree preservation order that um, Ms Erin spoke to on behalf of the trees. Do you wish to speak to this or straightforward enough? Uh, just quickly, um, I won't go on too much. Uh, the, the trees were nominated by the owner uh, and as such uh, the proposal is not contentious and didn't require the engagement of an external arborist. Uh, staff uh, as I've heard, it's recommended uh, TPOs over three of the five trees, but it's open to council to uh, apply TPOs to all of the trees as requested by the landowner. So just in relation to that, because clearly um, the property owner is supportive of tree two and four, I think it is also being included. Um, what would be the consequence for council or the town if they were to be included? Thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Um, is it not correct that a cluster of trees that are grouping like that, providing such um, canopy cover, also provide extensive habitat and food source for birds? So I'm curious why we would split that group up, because we have had groupings of trees before that have been put forward as a for tree preservation orders. Or maybe we haven't. <laughs> Actually, no, I got away with that one. Um, anyway, I'm thinking that um, as a group of trees that provides habitat, would it not be preferable to preserve the group as a cluster, the five trees? I think your questions are quite loaded, Councillor Hamilton. Mm. <laughs> uh, certainly, I've been used it. Okay. Okay, there's no further questions, we'll move on. Um, item 7.5 has been withdrawn. So item 7.6, it's the draft amended policy relating to awards. This will be used again, <laughs> Mr. Gibson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, this item seeks uh, Council's approval of a draft amended policy relating to awards. We do actually have a current policy, but it hasn't been reviewed for almost seven years. Uh, and also does not provide a great deal of guidance on the matter at hand. 
Uh, the draft amended policy seeks to establish an appropriate framework for community awards and includes provisions related to categories, nomination eligibility and nomination assessment parameters. Uh, it was previously distributed to councillors via the bulletin. Uh, staff received two responses, both which led to some changes to the draft, uh, and it's recommended that council adopt the policy. Thank you, Councillor Gandalf. Yeah, uh, just a quick one, not, not on this one. Sorry, my I didn't see you. You're next. My, my apologies, I missed this one. Just one question: We're never given a reason why those items were withdrawn from the agenda tonight. Oh, in regards to the local rules. Yes, um, because there's an outstanding council resolution that impacts on item 7.5. But in Synergy, they were assigned to two different areas of the organisation. And so the officer that wrote this report wants the opportunity to review those previous, um, a previous resolution. So that was one. Wasn't there two that were withdrawn tonight? Yeah, together. They were together, the CAT law and the Thorough Affairs law. Oh, OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Quinton? And then so we're up to yep yep um, scholarships to primary schools. What policy does that fall under? Is it an? It's under this one. Where is it that in the? Do I see that? In annual school awards. It's point two, the very end of the policy. Oh, it's the very end. Wasn't scrolling fast enough. <laughs> So I think there was a proposal to maybe review because at the moment we provide a financial um, award. It's been quite generous. Yes, five hundred dollars for year six students. Um, so looking at maybe even the opportunity of lessening that amount and providing. Can I just? But I, this is not a question, just a statement. I got the Bassendean Primary School Scholarship Award in 1992, and I think it was $100. So, <laughs> inflation's great. Carry on. Councillor um, Okay, well, Did you receive any awards? <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. I didn't grow up in this state, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an outlier that came and settled here. Sorry, I, I've, I've, I've led you down a tangent. Your question on this report, please. Oh, nice. Okay, so, um, I was curious about the um, inequality between the financial contributions to the school awards and a framed certificate for the other seven categories. Um, I felt that that was a little bit inconsistent. Um, so I'm wondering if the administration might consider looking at that again. I did raise it during my feedback to the administration on these awards. Um, and I'd also like to separate out particularly the Best Verge Award, because I believe that that should be a competition that has some sort of benefit other than a frame certificate. And I would direct the staff to look at the uh, Garden Awards from the City of Bayswater and what they offer to their residents for those awards. It's quite interesting. Obviously a much bigger council with much more money than we do, but I do think that perhaps the, you know, the frame certificate to me is so old-fashioned. <laughs> I, think, I think the idea is not the frame certificate, but it's the recognition amongst your community, um, just like the Community Citizen of the Year. It's not a check that goes with that, but it's it's the recognition of the contribution, the celebration. Best Garden, Best Verge Award, I can tell you now, people want plants or money. Councillor <laughs> okay. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Which, which line item or which part of the budget would we find the money allocated for annual school awards if we were to look for them? That would be in the councillor's budget. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you. We'll move on then. So item 7.7, .7, it's the annual budget the November review. So as people remember, we committed to having two budget reviews for this year. So Mr. White's been very busy with his team preparing this for us. Would you like to speak to the set one first? Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, that's uh, Councillor. So this is the first of two reviews this year, budget review. Um, I guess the intent um, was to try and make it a balanced budget. So they really presented us with an opportunity to to have an early uh, realignment just to reflect um, some of the changes that perhaps have occurred since the end of the financial year. I guess also reflecting um, the uncertainty in which the budget was set. Um, so towards the middle of the, um, the worst part of the 
over to. Um, so, happy to answer any uh, questions if you want to. So, just acknowledging that you've already spent an evening in a workshop with councillors on this item. Um, I just have one question for you. On page 33 of Thursday, it's probably not for you actually so much, it's probably for Mr Adams, um, referring to the Mon Street footpath. I just wanted to get some clarity because I know we've had lots of conversations about footpaths mm. and what actually was happening in that particular location. Um, yeah, thanks, Madam Mayor. Yes, our, um, our intention is to remove Mon Street from, from this year's program. Uh, okay, so on the, in the report here it says expenditure forecast to exceed budget. So if we're removing it, how will it exceed I the budget? I'm, I recall the question at the uh, at the workshop. Um, you probably asked it then too. Did yeah, I? yeah, and we the the answer. And I, I think there's a there's just an issue with the spreadsheet. Some of the okay. notation note, notation in there. Um, in that the we did change the design, and that meant the budget the cost did go up. Yep. But then at a later we item, removed we removed it. it. So I'll just um, I'll chase up with Paul's team and make sure that that's okay. true and correct. Can we just make sure that the um, report that comes to Council next week clearly articulates yeah. that rather than it being a little bit confusing? Yeah. Councillor Wilson, thank you. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, have any of the items um, that are listed here in the table? In the attachments, you mean? Uh, yeah, in yeah. the attachments uh, where there's individual line items for various forms of capital expenditure and operational expenditure. Have, have any of those items not gone out for tenders? Do you mean for a quote, which ones would go out for tenders? Well, I guess that's what I'm asking is that if any of these line items not yet gone out to the market. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, um, none of the line, none of the line items for the um, capital expenditure would be the market at this point, and we're waiting for um, council endorsement of the potential. Right. I, I just raised it in the context of previous decisions that councils made to not advertise individual line items prior to them going to the tender, just to see if we change that decision or if it's an oversight. I'm not sure if any of these will go for tender. Because of the value of the. I think they're all fairly minor. I think the main items that we're pulling won't be going to come back. Maybe it's something you can follow up and get back to us after the meeting. Any other questions? Um, 7.8 is the meeting schedule for next year, 2021. Um, essentially what is set out are the proposed uh, briefing session dates, the OCM dates, the Audit and Governance Committee dates, um, emergency management, as well as proposed citizenship ceremonies. Um, next year is also an election year as well, um, so we're proposing a special council meeting to swear in new councillors on Monday the 18th of October, which enables enough uh, room in terms of an induction before the first council meeting of the new council. Um, caretaker period this year starts, I'm oh, sorry, next year, starts on the 9th of September, so the September uh, OCM is likely to be a light one. Councillor Quinton first and then Councillor Hamilton. No, um, Kath had her hand up first. Okay, if I had called you to ask Sorry. maybe you can just add, <laughs> ask your question. Okay. Sorry, Kath. Um, my question was about outside briefing sessions. Uh, what, do we have uh, any indication when we might go back to community briefing sessions? Um, not, not at this stage with the um, yeah, state of the nation and COVID. Um, but it's something that we could certainly revisit into the future if that's something councillors are, are interested in. So I think we're still allowed 100, 500 people or less <laughs> in a gathering. So do we suspect that we're going to attract 500 people to a briefing session? Is that the it's something that we can review? Okay, thank yep. you. Councillor Hamilton. 
Um, yes, I note that we again have four citizenship ceremonies listed um, and I would question that given the feedback that councillors provided at the events workshop where there was a suggestion given how small we are as a council that we could drop that down to three a year. Certainly the one in winter in June um, could potentially be um, the one that's least attended because it's so wintry and cold. So I would like to actually understand why um, we don't review these things um, as per the workshop. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. I will follow that up. I did think of you when I saw that in the, in the report and um, I think we'll just need to understand what the impacts are uh, in terms of people that are waiting for citizenship. So um, we'll we definitely follow that up before the ICM. Thank now you. it's your tech house yes, schedule. Thank you. Uh, perhaps if we could just get some tea and coffee, maybe some biscuits for those becoming citizens <laughs> at, a, at a citizenship ceremony. It's a bit stark the last time I, uh, I went to I, one. I think there anyway, were some learnings from the last one. Indeed, indeed. Uh, We've got three so that, I, 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 do, I do have a question, though. Um, now, uh, the annual meeting of electors is to be held in early 2021. No date, I note. This will be considered when Council adopt the annual report which will form part of the Audit and Governance Committee agenda in December 2020. So will this be coming the date for Council to consider the annual meeting of annual general meeting of electors in the December Council meeting? I, I, I would hope so. There's been a delay this year um, with some external factors um, including uh, a new audit team, a the introduction of a, a retrospective uh, provision, which has caused a delay in terms of the audit of accounts, the financial statements. Um, this feedback has been provided to OAG and also um, the Minister for Local Government. Um, it's caused a delay. So um, once those financial statements make their way to the Audit and Governance Committee and Council, we can set set the date for the annual general meeting of electors. So you're hoping that will be December council? All local so, governments yep. are in the same position and yep. I know EMRC are as well. Okay, um, just one further meeting, I, I forgot to bring it tonight but I did some research and I'm just a bit concerned because I do have numerous statements that were made uh, on record by now councillors regarding meetings not happening in January. Just wondering if we've considered having a meeting in January because there were a number of statements by um, councillors about the concerns about going from December to February for the community to ask questions. I was going to put my hand up and ask. <laughs> you got in there first. Um, if, if that is something council would like, we could facilitate. Okay, um, I do have a number of senior staff on leave in January, so it might just be me. <laughs> Councillor Gangel, are you just okay. stirring or is it a serious oh, consideration? I stirring. I think so too. <laughs> I think the statement that was made was general, generally we don't have a meeting in January. I think Councillor Gangel may be referring to some comments that were made before you were on council and another yes. councillor was a comment. It might, it Indeed. might be when uh, in the in, in, in Most definitely it was. Okay, <laughs> councillors, are there any other questions on... Yes, Councillor Hamilton. Um, can I just flag the April OCM and the September OCM, obviously Anzac Day and Queen's birthday. Um, can the administration ensure that we get our documents early? because obviously we won't have the normal Monday to liaise with staff on anything because of public holidays. Earlier than Thursday? Wednesday, it, two weeks early would be fabulous, but I won't even push it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, if everyone's happy, we'll move on to 7.9, which is the quarterly report that we also did have a recent session on with our CEO. Is there anything that you wanted to add to what you've previously um, we'll just very quickly, new report format, it's aligned to the new SCP and corporate business plan for the quarter ending September. It's slightly later than, than usual due to the timing of um, the approval of those plans um, and the creation of the new format and population of the document, but we to take any questions. I have a question. Um, so one of the resolutions that's flagged for deletion is on the top of page 7 of the attachment. Mm -hmm. So it. My question isn't so much specific to this particular item, but how we're dealing with items of this nature. So this one has a proportion, or has a component of the resolution. Um, it was in relation to a roofing issue with reflective roofing that was built next to a, um, 
a private property. And part of the resolution was um, that we were requested the staff to prepare a reflective roofing policy, which I note is addressed in the comment. But then the next point is, in future when capital works are planned to be conducted on one of the town's buildings that will potentially impact adjoining properties, communication with the adjacent property owners about the proposed works will be undertaken prior to any works commencing. So I'm not so much concerned specifically about this, but I'm just interested to know how we're capturing those kinds of resolutions that are basically a procedural or a policy issue when we're deleting um, council resolutions because I, we don't see procedures um, mm. and I know this policy hasn't yet been developed but internally what's happening so that these kind of things don't get lost? Well, most of them are picked up in some form of control whether it's a, a policy or um, operational procedure. Um, that specific one I'd have to actually have a look at. Yeah, that, that's fine. Can we just have no, like when things are recommended for deletion mm. that have components like that, if it has been incorporated into a procedure, can we have that noted so that we're aware that that has been addressed? Certainly. That would be great. Any other questions? Councillor Quinton? Can remind me, did we allocate $20,000 for uh, research into an emissions project in the budget? I can't hear you, what did you say? $20,000 to explore an emissions project in the budget? Was that something we, that we did? Yes. So I'm um, uh, through the chair um, <coughs> at Kilo Australia, which is uh, similar to the Assist Dates for uh, Came across and was proposing to um, run an aggregated um, approach amongst a number of councils, which helped to drive down the cost of green power. Um, at the moment, that um, approach is still, um, still out there and offer. Um, Walga is now also looking at um, a similar a similar approach as well. I'm going to a meeting in um, December to um, to find more information on that and attempts to report back to council after that. Is that why then that the emissions reduction strategy, the emissions reduction strategy for organisation community and organisation impl and implement them is not scheduled until the next financial year? Would it be assumed then that that twenty thousand dollars would have to roll over? Or are you going to spend that in this financial year? Um, look, I'm not, not certain at the moment, and I guess uh, when we put this up, is that the twenty thousand dollars was a um, was a potential requirement to enter into this um, uh, purchasing arrangement. But I have more information in general. I guess in terms of the uh, separating out these two these two pieces of thinking, um, what we're looking at at the moment now is for the um, purchase of green power for council as an organisation, and I guess the second phase of thinking is to say, well, how can we to support the community in their efforts to reduce their greenhouse emissions as well, so that's looking at um, two pieces of work. Um, the first one's probably more straightforward, you know, it um, um, has simple measures, and I guess um, um, we could put together a, an action plan that could, could deliver that, um, and then there's a broader, broader body of work that would need to be done to think about um, what is our role in supporting the community, and I imagine that that so what you're telling me is that we're not going to wait for the strategy to come out in order to implement any kind of easy project. We, we can implement those things no, if, in if, the interim? If, uh, if, um, if, so if there is something that is, that is straightforward to do, then um, I imagine that we can do that. At the end of the day, I guess um, we're... Um, We've got our last our last ten years that we can act on climate change, um, and so we should be trying to make those um, those calls when we can. So can I just? Um, I'm not sure where this landed, but you and I had a conversation recently about um, as one example for what um, Councillor Quint is referring to with that climate climate clever um, app, and that there was an opportunity to potentially make that available at a reduced price. Um, I'm not sure where that landed, but that's the kind of thing that we could implement in the interim before we actually have our formal strategy developed and adopted? Yes. Yeah, Thank you. Okay, is everybody happy to move on? Okay, 710 is the Emergency Management Committee meeting. Oh, yeah, I've got it. Sorry, was that a question? Sorry. Yes, let me just find it. Uh, one of the recommendations that was passed... Oh, it's going to be passed. 
crying now, I can't find it, was about a 50% reduction in someone's... Uh, no, that's audit rates. Audit and governance. Audit and governance. Yeah, Sorry, the next, next one. one. Mm. So we'll move on to audit and governance then. Um, so your question is in relation to the B um, concession for West Care. Yes. Yep. That's not come across us yet, has it? Um, it came through the audit and governance. Yes. So it was a recommendation for council to... Yes. So my question then is, if we approve this, these minutes, would that automatically be approved? Correct. Yes. yes. Would you like to speak to this, Mr. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. What? Um, so yes, we're taking the minutes from the um, last audit and governance committee meeting held on the 4th of November. Two main items um, that were discussed in public, uh, mainly the interim audit results. Then, um, uh, RSM's first order of town uh, has covered both finance and IT. And then the standing item is that the audit risk register, which considers um, all of the audit risks that have been identified for the town and the actions that are in progress in relation to those. There are three confidential items. One of those was a recommendation for a rates concession for Westcare, a 50% rates concession. Um, and it's recommended in this officer report that council grants the 50% rate concession to Westcare um, and receives the report of the Audit Governance Committee. So I, tr I looked everywhere and I couldn't find that confidential attachment to that meeting. So I don't know what it's about. Right. Did anyone else find it? Um, we were a number of us are members of that committee, so we were sent the confidential attachments as committee members. So I must admit I didn't go looking for it again. Um, but it may well be that others who weren't on that committee may not have received it as part of the agenda. I didn't get it. Okay. So can I have it? Well, yes, or I don't obviously compile the agenda, but I'll follow up on that. And just a question on process then. Um, does it ha should it, is, the, is it normal process that it goes audit, through audit and governance first? Uh, or, like other things that we've made decisions on waiving fees, why didn't this get taken out as a standalone council resolution? Um, well, there is a standalone council resolution um, in the Office of Recommendation to, to grant the waive, to waive the fees. Um, I mean not buried within the minutes of another meeting. Right. The, the recommendation to the Office of Report 7.11 7.11 that council grant 50% rate concession to Westcare. Yeah. Um, so that's in the, the minutes of, for the ACM next week. Um, in, the, in the agenda. In the agenda, meeting. sorry, yep. the uh, council meeting next week. Yep. Um, the, that was not the subject of an attachment, it was the subject of a confidential agenda item for the Audit and Governance Committee. Mm. So I suspect there has been an administrative error in that council may not have been provided with those uh, the three confidential agenda. Because normally items. it does go in. Yeah, it's yeah. normally that. Um, what has happened in the past um, is that this would normally be approved as part of the, the annual budget process. And council has granted a concession to West Care uh, in the past as part of the annual budget process. Um, with the adoption of the of our new um, rates concession um, policy, they were asked to make application under that policy for specific consideration by council and we brought them through the audit governance committee. So at the committee this was also raised and I think he said that this would be the only time that it would be going through this process and in the future they'd make their application in advance and so we wouldn't have to waive them after the rating period, is that correct? That's correct Madam Mayor, thank you. So yeah, in the future um, we would encourage applicants to make application in time for it to be considered as part of the annual budget process. But this is, it does provide us with a mechanism to um, bring these matters to council outside of that, that annual budget process. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, great. So um, 7.12 is the monthly financial report. few questions but just a number I'll ask now. Um, I noticed on page five it lists uh, design review panel. Have we had an application that has used the design review panel? Which one is that? I'm not sure exactly okay. at, least, uh, at least two of them. Okay, that's great. Um, on page six it refers to the community cinemas and 
a cost of $1,866 for yellow sand. I'm assuming this is to get the site set up. I'm just, yeah, I'm just wondering when we get costings for these, um, you know, like for cinemas, whether it includes these kind of um, items or whether these are additional things that we are funding sort of later down the track. I'll have to follow that up. Yeah, that's all right. It just It would just be helpful for us to have as much as possible, yeah, the overall cost so that we understand um, the implications of any of those decisions. Um, and my last question that I'll ask now is in page seven, um, which lists our insurance fee to LGIS. Um, I understood that there was a meeting happening with them. Has that happened um, yet? They did come and brief staff on um, Monday this week, and there's some further work that needs to be done to. Um, consider a potential strategy for community groups. Yeah. So we've got a community directory and looking at, um, I guess, the criteria around who who we may fund yeah. and what that might look like. So there's there's a bit of planning to okay. do around that. Great producing process. Excellent. Any other questions from councillors? Okay, so moving on to item eight, which is the notice of motion that I submitted following our did you have one second? Um, sorry, Madam Mayor, I think we want to speak to the financial status. Oh, how did I do that? Sorry. So we're on the monthly financial report. Thank you very much for that. Would you like to speak to it? Uh, only to say um, that it, it closes the monthly financial report by uh, September and October of this particular month before we really set back uh, in uh, September. Um, Thank you. My apologies for skipping over it. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, so um, back to item eight, which was the notice of motion following our decision at last month's meeting. Councillor Gadger? Yes, thank you, Richard. Um, what is the difference between the two? Uh, the difference between the two is in relation to the second part. What's it called? The conservation run home. What's the word I'm seeing Mr Gibson? Heritage Conservation Notice. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. And why, why the change of heart? Um, well, during the meeting last time, it became apparent that we had the option of applying Heritage Conservation Notice only for part of the works. Um, and the proposed um, revocation motion would still apply that for the first half of the works, but would allow them um, to apply for grant funding if we don't have the Heritage Conservation Notice over the second lot of works. Ah, um, also just one thing, ordinarily staff comment, I note there's no staff comment on this one. Uh, it was an unusual one in that it came in, um, and I've never dealt with one of these before, um, uh, <laughs> the morning after... The council meeting? Yes, yes, yep. yes. and so there's provision up until 10 a.m. the following You're day I'm aware of that. Um, for an alternate motion. Yes. I think Councillor Gantry was seeking some feedback from the staff on yes. the proposal, as in whether it's supportive or not. Yes. Um, I don't believe there are any objections, but Mr Gibson may be better positioned. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, the proposal uh, on page 60 is uh, satisfactory. It's certainly open to Council to issue a notice for part of the works and not all the works. Um, and obviously the, uh, the what's contained on page 60 provides for a uh, subsequent report to be brought back to council in due course. Thank you. Thank you um, can I just ask the second part of the alternative um, motion, um, bringing it back to council if there's no substantially commenced um, work, do you have a rough timeline of when that, like for instance, if they haven't put in their application um, for the second part of the works, would that come back fairly quickly to council? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, given the uh, the time frame that you've put on part two, being the 30th of June, I'd suggest it would be July or August. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you, councillors. Um, the remainder is confidential business, so I'd like to thank our community members for being in attendance. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Good night.